Uh, welcome back to History Chat on Thursday at one o'clock, where we are talking about the history of the Republican Party. My name is Heather Cox Richardson, and I am a professor of history, but I do not speak for my employer when I do these videos. It's my usual disclaimer. I also have a different disclaimer for this week, and that is to say that I'm going to get into the Clinton years this week, and I'm slowing this material way down because so many of us lived it, and because so many to so many of us, I think it seems much more important now than we thought perhaps it was at the time. Lots of seeds laid in those years for um, for things that came later. But I do want to emphasize something. As I was going over the material uh, today, it's um, uh, uh, this is the version of, um, of this era from the Republican perspective. I mean, obviously, if I were giving it to you from the Democratic perspective, I would give you a really different story. And and one of the things that I think that, that there will be criticism of when I go through this material is people are going to say, I could write the post now. People saying, why didn't you talk about, you know, what Clinton did here or what um, what the new Democrats did or, or where the slips were? Because that's not today's story. Those stories, that story is there. It's a valid story, but that's not my story today because in the sweep of this particular series, I'm doing the history of the Republican Party. And as I'd say, if you did it from the Democrats, it would be a different story. But it would be yet a third story if you did it from the perspective of both parties, which is what I was really trying to do in How the South Won the Civil War. But that's such a short book, it was hard to, to really do what one could do with it from the perspective of both parties. So if you listen to this and get compl you know complain because I don't really talk about what Clinton is up to or what Clinton's advisors are up to or what um, Hillary Clinton is up to or about the development of uh, a universal health care uh, bill during that administration, it's because that's not my story. All right. And I'm assuming that everybody can hear this. Um, if not, I, I can't believe somebody wouldn't have uh, said so at this point. So let's go ahead and start. And where I left you last week was with the, and again, just, just so you know, I'm really only going to do the Clinton years today. And I'm going to pick up from on the heels of that, what happened after the Clinton years and, and how that played out. But um, but I'm really expanding this this later material because it seems like it's of interest. I actually find the Clinton years from the perspective of the Republican Party fascinating. All right, so um, so I'm going to pick this up here where I left last week was with the election of Bill Clinton and his vice president, Al Gore Jr., to be a president and vice president of the United States. And again, what I'm following through here is the... Um, the Republican version of this story. And for Republicans who had felt uh, movement conservatives, the movement conservative faction in the Republican Party, who had felt that George H.W. Bush was not uh, conservative enough for them, was not cutting taxes the way they wished. Instead, uh, with the Omnibus Act, he actually increases taxes, was not behaving in the ways that they thought were important. They looked at the election of Bill Clinton as an abomination. So if they felt that that George H.W. Bush wasn't enough of a tax cutter for them. He wasn't doing enough to take America back to the 19, the, the government of the 1920s. If they thought he was bad, Clinton was, like I say, an abomination. I mean, it wasn't just a question of we disagree with you. It was more a question of you are the enemy. And one of the parallels here that's important for this era, and they, the, the movement conservatives actually talk about this. They say with the fall of... Um, the USSR with the, 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 the dissolution of the, um, the USSR, what that does is it permits America to turn away from fighting communism abroad and instead to fight it, as they say, at home. And they want to do with, um, with the liberal consensus in America what they feel they have done with communism abroad. That is, they first of all um, contained it, and then under Reagan, they rolled it back, if you remember the, the Reagan doctrine. And so what they argue is that they want to do the same thing in America at home domestically with the liberal consensus. That's that idea that's shared by traditional Republicans and Democrats, that the government has a role to play in protecting Americans by regulating business and in providing a basic social safety net and in promoting infrastructure. They want to roll that back. First, they want to contain it, and then they want to roll it back. And that's what they're going to be trying to do during the Clinton administration. And it's going to give us a lot of the patterns that we still have today. 
So one of the first things they do is they continue to hammer home the idea that taxes are bad. Now, polls that were taken at the time suggested that Americans were really not that concerned about taxes. Um, There had been problems with them during the 1970s, during that period of extraordinary inflation, when you kept finding yourself in higher and higher tax brackets, when your money went went less and less far. But by the 1990s, that's really not an issue. that, um, That stagflation system has broken and people are not that concerned about taxes. So the the movement conservatives have to manufacture concern about taxes, and they go ahead and they set out to do that. What they do is they insist that slashing taxes is going to be a recipe for an ever-expanding economy. And you can see, again, people nowadays on um, on the Trump team, for example, insisting that the way to bring America back is to slash taxes. And one of the things, again, um, and one of the things that President Trump has talked about quite recently is getting rid of the payroll tax. But again, the payroll tax, as I explained on Tuesday, actually funds Social Security. So it's simply, you know, that tax language is actually designed to do something governmentally. It's designed to get rid of a government that actually provides a basic social safety net and protects people and, and um, and promotes infrastructure. So what happens is that um, they they, t- they take out this tax cut language and really dramatically in 1993 in um, New Jersey, uh, a woman named Christine Todd Whitman, who's been in the, the news again today because now she has come, uh, not today, I'm sorry, lately, because she has endorsed um, Democrat Joe Biden over um, Republican Donald Trump. Um, she came out, she actually did, did not have a lot of credentials at all when she was running, but she came out on an anti-tax platform. And when she did that, she came from uh, 20 points behind to go ahead and win the governorship of New Jersey. And she did that by calling in Grover Norquist, the guy who had said that we must get rid of taxation. I told you about him before. He was a lawyer for the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, still is alive, of course. I don't know if he's still a lawyer for the Chamber of Commerce, but my point is he is not uh, an elected official. He is a lawyer for the Chamber of Commerce. Um, And he simply said, we're going to hammer home again and again and again the concept of supply side economics, that if you cut taxes and put more money at the top, at the supply side, people at the top are going to employ people at the bottom and all boats will rise. That's the opposite of the traditional Republican view that you, from people like Abraham Lincoln or Teddy Roosevelt or Eisenhower, that you needed to provide money and security and opportunity to access resources to people at the bottom, the demand side of the economy. So what, what the Republicans are saying in the, in the 1980s and really letting it take off in the 1990s is the idea that if you simply put money at the top, at the supply side, that the government is going to work uh, much more efficiently. And, And one of the sleights of hand here is that essentially that says to voters, you can have all the the programs you like. You can have Social Security and you can have um, educational programs and all the things you like, but you don't have to pay for them because cutting taxes will actually pay for those programs. And it obviously we know it doesn't work. Um, Now we have, um, we know it doesn't work, but, um, but this is the argument that they uh, that they advance, and they do so again with the support by now of economists like Milton Friedman and like people in the University of Chicago who become known as the Chicago economists, um, who begin who argue that that basically this system is really what's going to save the U.S. economy. All right, so what happens is that increasingly. Um, they the the movement conservatives taking power or, or taking um speaking up within the the republican party under people like newt gingrich of georgia um continually insist that um the the democrats are in fact uh buying votes with their social welfare legislation. They are cheating, if you will, by trying to simply give stuff to minorities, essentially, and uh, feminist women in order to be reelected and to put into office. That basically this is an advanced system of um, of socialism, that uh, it's a redistribution of wealth on the part of the Democrats to um, to offer stuff, free stuff to their voters in order to get their votes. And again, I've mentioned this a number of times. This is a, a trope right out of Reconstruction, the idea that if you let people, uh, you let black people vote, um, they're going to vote for programs um, that are going to that are going to cost tax dollars, and the people who are going to be paying for those things are white tax on, uh, white white property owners. That's picked up really dramatically 
again uh, it, after Reagan, uh, but certainly, or really after Brown v. Board, but after Reagan, and certainly it really hits the ground running in the Clinton years. So under the Clinton, um, during the Clinton years, the movement conservatives really hammer home on this idea that that things like the Violence Against Women Act, I mean, you look at that and you think, wait a minute, how is that socialism, the idea that you're trying to protect women from, from violence, how is the Violence Against Women Act socialist? Well, what they argue is that it's simply an attempt to create more government jobs because, of course, you're going to have programs, uh, government programs to protect women from violence. Or things like support for education was simply an attempt to put money into teachers unions or, the, or to indoctrinate children with liberal ideas or that um, uh, uh, support for affirmative action, for example, was reverse discrimination because it discriminated against white men, especially both in hiring practices, but also for the fact that they're going to have to pay the tax dollars to implement affirmative action. So always in this argument about the structure of government is the issue of taxation and the idea that people at the bottom, who in America are overwhelmingly people of color and, uh, and women, that people at the bottom should not have the ability to vote for programs that are going to cost tax dollars that they, in this formulation, are not going to be paying. Because what the, the movement conservatives really focus on are things like income taxes. Of course, everybody pays sales taxes. And of course, um, what, uh, and I'll tell you a little bit more about this, people with, uh, with means get major tax write-offs um, through a different system that I will tell you a little bit more about. So this idea really takes off, especially after 1993, with the Motor Voter Act. The Motor Voter Act is the, uh, the, the law that says that you can register to vote at your registry of motor vehicles, but also at a number of other um, government offices, including welfare offices. And Republicans hit the ground running with the 1993 Motor Voter Act in which they say Democrats are simply buying votes. It's not a question of making this country more democratic and making it easier for people to vote. It's simply Democrats trying to pack the system against the Republicans. And this is where that language really takes off, the idea that by letting more people vote, Democrats are somehow cheating. And you can see, obviously, where this has gotten to us today. These arguments reach really widely because, as I mentioned before, after the end of the Fairness Doctrine in 1987 under Reagan, you get the rise of talk radio. And talk radio um, is dominated by right-wing talk show hosts who are no longer bound by any kind of fact-checking or any kind of requirement to be, be reflecting reality and different points of view. They can say anything they want, and they go ahead and do so. And of course, the king of all this is Rush Limbaugh. And the reason that Rush Limbaugh ended up getting a Presidential Medal of Honor was his role in spreading this movement conservative idea. Because uh, in the early, by the early 1990s, Rush Limbaugh is appearing on 659 radio stations around the country. He's really, really popular. And in 1993, uh, 1992, I'm sorry, most people have forgotten this, Limbaugh actually had a television show. And that television show was a forerunner to Fox News. It was produced by Roger Ailes. And by 1994, it was carried on 225 television stations. So you can see this idea of spreading movement conservatism through a new right-wing media. Well, from the beginning, as I say, the movement conservatives have, had seen Clinton not as a legitimate opponent, but as a, a, an abomination, as somebody who should never have been in the White House. And even though he was elected, um, the, that just proves that certain people shouldn't be voting. And that's, again, a trope right out of the late 19th century. So from the very beginning, the movement conservatives are desperate to undermine him. And if you, you may or may not remember, there were all sorts of scandals at the beginning of the Clinton administration, including something about, um, I believe it was the First Lady's travel office. I mean, they, they kept trying and trying and trying to find something that might stick, and nothing did. And finally, they started poking at um, a land development project in the Ozark Mountains, something called Whitewater. And they accused the Clintons of being involved in, uh, in a, a, a corrupt land deal. And the story behind it was this. The Clintons invested $40,000 in this, con this land development company, and they lost their shirts. They lost their investment. 
after they had been working with the, the guy who was running Whitewater, after they'd lost their investment, he went on to uh, to to have a number of shady deals. They were not part, they had not invested in him at that point, but they had invested with him in this earlier project. And, and, and as I say, they lost their shirts in it. But finally, um, uh, there was so much mm, sort of news out there about Whitewater, Clinton decided that he was going to go ahead and okay a special prosecutor to look into it because he was thoroughly convinced that they would find nothing. And in fact, Whitewater does die in the, in the, in the Whitewater, if you will. But one of the things that he miscalculated on was that he had appointed a Republican, but a fair-minded Republican, to run the the special, uh, the to be the special prosecutor. But movement conservatives nixed that guy and replaced him with Ken Starr, Kenneth Starr. And Kenneth Starr um, had no prosecutorial experience, but he was connected to what was known as the Arkansas Project. And the Arkansas Project was a group that was funded by a billionaire a guy named Richard Mellon Scythe, and his only goal in life was to get rid of Clinton and to, to really bring down Clinton. So um, the Arkansas Project had been pushing the idea of a former Arkansas government employee, a woman named Paula Jones, to argue that she had been sexually harassed by Clinton during his term as govern governor. With his ability to subpoena witnesses, Ken Starr goes ahead and he subpoenas Paula Jones. And um, and he, he, you know, th there's clearly all this talk out there about what's going on with Paula Jones. I'm going to go ahead and finish the Paula Jones story and then come back to where one get, get from that. Um, the argument was that, that Bill Clinton had sexually harassed Paula Jones and discriminated against her in later hiring. In fact, as the, as the story came out, he had, in fact, uh, apparently propositioned her. But when she turned him down, he um, he he didn't there was no punishment for that. He um, uh, he actually she actually got a promotion. So she ended up losing her case, as I recall. Anyway, while all this is going on, there's something else that matters, and that's that shortly before Clinton took office, um, in um, um, uh, 1992, in August of 1992, there was a standoff in, um, um, here we go, let me make sure I get it right, um, there was a standoff in, um, in Idaho at Ruby Ridge, when our government of forces tried to arrest a guy named Randy Weaver. And Randy Weaver was a former factory worker who had moved his family to northern Idaho because he worried about the corruption of American society. And, and um, Weaver was, um, on, uh, was supposed to show up for trial on a federal firearms charge, and he didn't. And when the federal marshals tried to go in and arrest him, there was a standoff on both sides. There's a firefight that killed Weaver's 14-year-old son and a deputy marshal, eventually killed Weaver's wife, Vicki. And when that happened after Ruby Ridge, or, I mean, after that first, the beginning of the standoff, there was a nearby Aryan Nations um, compound. And neo-Nazis and far-right uh, activists from that compound rushed over to Ruby Ridge. And uh, the stand and negotiators finally brought Weaver out. But the standoff at Ruby Ridge convinced a lot of people who um, sort of loved the idea of Red Dawn and, and were eating up the idea that the U.S. government was, was falling to communism or to socialism. It convinced them really to begin... Um, um, uh, organizing as militias, as Western militias. Similarly, uh, so, so while all this other stuff is going on with Clinton in 1993, you also have in February of 1993 that same theme that happened in Ruby Ridge playing out in Waco, Texas. And what happened there was that officers, federal officers, stormed the compound of a religious cult because their leader, a man named David Koresh, was uh, uh, former members of the cult had come out and had said that Koresh was stockpiling weapons. And uh, the federal government went in to, to rescue the people who were there in the, and holding people hostage. And they went in to rescue the people that were there. And they ended up in a 51-day siege um, that ended on April 19th of 1993 and left 76 people dead. 
Well, the Republicans look into what happened at Waco, but uh, and and with a Republican investigation into Waco, the Republican investigation said there was quote overwhelming evidence unquote that the government should be exonerated for wrongdoing. It was right to go into Waco, Texas, but those talk show hosts that are gaining so much traction begin to rail against the Clinton administration, especially against the Attorney General, a woman named. Janet Reno, um, who uh, they increasingly portray as sort of this man-like non-woman, if you will. And people like uh, Rush Limbaugh especially kept stoking anger by talking about the Waco invasion, the government's murder of citizens, and arguing that what was going on with the Koresh cult was simply that they were a bunch of good Christian individualists taking care of their women and children, and they were being destroyed by this, this, this what he would call, um, this offensive term, a feminazi. And that uh, is that that language is actually what prompted Alex Jones, who is now the the um, the guy who's uh, uh, you know the the Infowars guy, Alex Jones, to drop out of community college and to start a talk show where he hammered again and again and again on the idea that Janet Reno had murdered people at Waco and that the government was about to impose martial law. And with that, you again got the fueling of the idea of a modern day militia movement, especially in tandem with that motor voter law. So um, those dates are important, and I, I mentioned those dates. I'm going to go back now to the political story for a second because with the um, with the motor voter law, with this this increasing sense that Clinton is a communist trying to take down American society, and with the idea that Americans have to fight back against that, um, a couple of things happen. First of all, in the 1994 midterm elections, there's it's a terrible year. Um, for, uh, well, the, there are actually 175, 175 House seats that are in play. That means that it's pretty clear that any, they could go either way. And the Republican National Committee um, just pours money into them, trying to break the Democratic lock on the House. And to do that, the Republicans offer something called the Contract with America. And that Contract with America is written by Newt Gingrich and, uh, and with his advisor, Grover Norquist. Again, not an elected official. That bothers me, as you can tell, that a man who has never held elective office holds such power in our government. Um, along with a representative from Texas, a guy named, David, uh, named uh, Dick Armey. And they called it a contract because they said Americans were tired of empty promises from politicians and this was a contract and they promised that it would be binding. Here's a spoiler, they're not going to be mentioning it all again by 1996. It's binding for about a minute and a half until the end of the election. But anyway, the contract called uh, for a small government and said that if, if Republicans were put back in charge of the House, it would immediately on their first day, enact eight changes, including auditing Congress, cutting one third of House committees and their staff, and in making it a rule that you had to have three fifths of Congress on board in order to pass a tax increase. And in the following 99 days after that, the, the idea of 100 days is a big deal since FDR, the first 100 days of an administration, people get all bent out of shape about that first 100 days. They say in the next 100 days, they are going to, to balance the budget, put through a line item veto, which is something Americans have argued about really since the beginning of the Constitution, um, welfare cuts, an anti-crime bill, and a whole bunch of what are called tax expenditures. And tax expenditures are really interesting. Um, I'm going to tell you more about those in a minute, but they're essentially welfare for people with money, and I'll explain how they work. It's a crappy name. All right, so... Um, um, I'm seeing comments about Janet Reno on, on Saturday Night Live. I just have to say what I didn't talk about here, and, and I just, I, I will, I don't really want you to Google it, but uh, what's his name? Ted Nugent still does an act featuring Janet Reno and how it's, it's, it's just vile beyond belief. It's called, it's, it goes to his song, Kiss My Glock, and he has an image of her on stage, and it's obscene. I mean, so don't Google it, especially with your children around, but, um, but I, I think, I think probably people who don't, travel in those fever swamps are not aware of just what a, a, a caricature and boogeyman she became for um, for uh, 
for movement conservatives. I mean, she's a she's bright, brilliant woman who who's done exciting things, but in their minds, she is all that was wrong with America. A woman who was trying to take on a man's role, which is if you remember my talk about cowboys and the cowboy imagery of the movement conservatives, they want no part of women who are um, operating outside of the roles of wives and mothers. And you can see this dramatically in what I'm going to talk about in just a second, the rise of Fox News and what that actually looks like, the Fox News channel. All right, so with that in 1994, a couple of things happened. First of all, uh, people like Lim Rush Limbaugh push this idea of the contract with America again and again and again, and they keep attacking Clinton, and they keep talking about how corrupt Clinton is, and they keep on talking about how the Democrats are simply trying to buy votes, and it works. Voters swing 54 seats away from the Democrats into the hands of the Republicans, giving the Republicans control of the House of Representatives for the first time since Eisenhower's administration, for the first time since 1954. In the Senate, the Republicans pick up eight seats as well, giving the Senate to Republicans too. So Bill Clinton is now going to be facing a Republican House and a Republican Senate. What this means is that Newt Gingrich is now going to be Speaker of the House. And if anybody's interested, and, and I know that you probably aren't, but reading the newspapers from when that switch happens is really interesting because the the, the movement conservatives are giddy. But one of the things I talk about, maybe not so much here, is it's really difficult to go from being an opposition party to being a ruling party because you need a different skill set for those two things. And the same guys who are great at tearing stuff down are generally terrible at building stuff up. And, um, and they, it's very rare for people to be able to make that transition. You see it really dramatically with the Republican Party after uh, the Woodrow Wilson administration when they simply don't know what to do in the 1920s, so they turn everything over to Herbert Hoover's at, at Commerce. But you also see it right here in the 1990s. So what happens is um, the Republicans have, uh, the movement conservatives who now are really riding high because under Gingrich's formula, they are, um, they've taken control of the House and the Senate. They seem to be um, able to do whatever they want. And one of the first things they do is they make Rush Limbaugh an honorary member of the freshman class of the, of, of the House of Representatives, um, which is kind of a thing. You, you go by classes, uh, not, not as, as rigorously as you do in college, but you're known as part of a certain class, the people who come in in that year. They make Rush Limbaugh an honorary member of that, and he outlines their agenda and listen to what that agenda is. And by the way, this is reprinted in newspapers at the time. He says, uh, the first thing that the Republicans must do is they must, quote, begin an emergency dismantling of the welfare system, which is shredding the social fabric. Bankrupting, that's the end of the quote, bankrupting the country, and as he says, gutting the work ethic, educational performance, and moral discipline of the poor. Unquote. So you got to get rid of the welfare system because it is ruining poor people. It's making them lazy. It's making them unwilling to work. It's shredding the country's social fabric. Next, Congress should, he says, cut capital gains taxes because that is going to drive economic growth and it's going to create hundreds of thousands of jobs and it's going to generate billions of dollars in federal revenue. And there's that supply side economics idea coming back again, that if you get rid of taxes, it's going to make people uh, reinvest in the economy and all boats are going to rise. It's a great idea. It really is. Um, if only it worked. Uh, and, and, you know, it'd be interesting if, to see if, if there are, there would be some way to make it work. Um, but right now we don't have any evidence that it actually works. Um, next, um, uh, Limbaugh actually kept a staff in Washington so that he would make sure that he knew what was going on in Washington and that he could make sure that the ideas of the movement conservatives did in fact get through to the voters. And that was his thing. You tell me what you want me to say, I'll make sure it gets out to people. And similarly, if you don't, you Congress critters don't behave, by the way, that in, in my parlance, that's a word of endearment. It comes from Molly Ivins. Um, and somebody thought I was making fun of Congress people when I said that. To me, it just rolls off the tongue more easily than Congress people. And, um, and I have a, a sneaking fond, fondness, of course, for people in Congress, because that's who I study. Um, so when I slip and say something like that, I'm not intending to insult anybody. It's actually kind of, for me, a term of endearment. Um, and, and I don't mean for it to be offensive. It's to honor Molly Ivins and Congress critters, if you will. Um, in exchange, though, Congress 
people knew that if they uh, said something that Rush Limbaugh didn't like, they would be condemned on his radio channels across the country. So they had to fall in line with him as well. And as soon as the Gingrich revolutionaries, as they called themselves, were in power, they took, uh, they hit the ground running. Um, Gingrich, of course, became Speaker of the House. Dick Armey was House Majority Leader, and um, and Thomas uh, and Tom Delay from Texas becomes Majority Whip. And uh, in 1995, they issued an internal memo which uh, said that the main theme of the Republican Party was no longer going to be paying down the national debt; it was going to be cutting taxes. And um, that was the main principle now of republicanism and um uh, norquist as the wall street journal wrote had become one of the main players in the republican party uh that he had remade the republicans from this this party of fiscal conservatism to a party of tax cuts um they um tried as well to uh to create a balanced budget amendment the problem with a balanced budget amendment is of course it you see this. You see exactly the problem with a budget balanced budget amendment in a different way right now with states and local uh, budgets in the middle of this pandemic. They have no wiggle room to deal with this crisis of the coronavirus, and so they're in terrible trouble. The federal government would be in the same boat if you had a balanced budget amendment. There are certain times you don't want to balance the budget. That's maybe a different story. Um, and in the end, uh, Gingrich's revolutionaries had way overstepped what was possible. Um, they, they triumphantly passed some of their measures, but then they got watered down in the Senate, which at the time was still somewhat collegial, and recognized that the, the new House class was kind of far out there. And then, of course, uh, Clinton vetoed uh, some of the things they passed. Uh, and they, they, of course, refused to work in any way with Clinton, um, so he had to hammer stuff together. And finally, Gingrich and his people were so um, frustrated by the fact that Clinton would not do what they said, they actually pulled out a technique that the uh, Democrats had tried in 1879, and that is when they didn't like the budget, they simply refused to compromise and they shut down the government. The federal government shut down for a total of 28 days between November of 1995 and January of 1996. And they thought that people would be angry at Clinton, but they were wrong. People were angry at them for not compromising. And they ended up sort of having to put their tail between their legs and come back uh, and, and open up the government again. But uh, what this did is it essentially made them abandon the contract with America. And by March of 1996, nobody was talking ever again about that famous contract with America. Um, but by then, their apocalyptic rhetoric had really taken off. And one of the things that um, there's, there's two ways in this, this in which this takes off. The first is that the 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 Republicans under uh, I'm sorry the Republicans in the House and the Senate begin to argue that there's no way that Democrats can legitimately be uh, be winning office. So they invoke laws launch investigations into elections that they argue were stolen by voter fraud on the heels of the motor voter law. And during the course of, I think it's 93, 94, I'd have to check, um, they, they challenge uh, two uh, major elections. I think it's Diane Feinstein in California and Mary Landrieu in Louisiana, off the top of my head. And I could be wrong about that. So, I mean, no one's taking notes, but if you were, check that baby or text me and I'll, I'll answer. Or, you know, message me and I'll answer. But um, they argued that those women had had earned had won office through voter fraud. And um, if you remember, and you probably don't remember, Reagan is the one who really kind of started this idea in 1986 when uh, the Republicans begin to talk about voter integrity. Uh, and, and they literally write memos saying that this should manage to throw a lot of black people off the voting rolls. Well, by 1993, 1994, they're saying that Democrats are cheating to win election. And I just have to emphasize here again, the evidence for voter fraud in America is infinitesimal. It is virtually a non-issue. Um, the things that, and you, you can see this from the fact that, for example, as soon as he went into office, Trump appointed Chris Kobach to go ahead and have a voter fraud um, uh, commission, and they had to fold their tents. They had nothing. There is no dispute about this. 
There is no dispute about this. There are there are nonpartisan organizations like the Brennan Center at New York University that that does nothing but study voter fraud. And what they show you again and again and again and again is that it really is not a problem in America. Um, uh, what what Republicans tend to focus on is things like you know registration lists that say that have Daffy Duck on them. Well, Daffy Duck doesn't vote. Uh, you know that's the you know the registration lists sometimes look look iffy, but that's that's very different than who actually votes. And similarly, sending out applications for a, a, a mail mail. Um, a mail-in ballot, you know, you could send something to a to a dog, which is what they allege. I don't know if it's happened, but that doesn't mean the dog's going to actually fill it out and vote. So again, this idea that the Democrats are cheating to win election is just a, a political, a rhetorical political construction, deliberate rhetorical political construction. And you see this with this year-long investigation of these two elections that I'm talking about that were in front of the news uh, teams again and again and again, and accustomed Americans to the idea that there was such a thing as voter fraud. Um, they, they disbanded. And what Gingrich said at the time was, um, we didn't find the evidence, but that's because it was so well hidden. Well, you know, the, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you argue with that? All right. So while that's going on, there's this idea that Democrats are stealing elections, um, and that they're creating this, this behemoth government, um, dominated by poor, lazy people of color and feminist women like Janet Reno, who want to, you know, kill Christians in this formulation. Um, this takes on a life of its own. And you see this, um, really through, uh, through the media and also through talk radio and through fax machines. There's actually this whole movement that, that, that operates through fax machines. People start faxing their Congress people. Um, you probably don't even remember what fax machines are. Um, I actually had a conversation with a, with a young person recently who was just clued into the fact they stood for facsimile machines. And I was like, oh man, this is the part of history we miss. So many things that we think are obvious, they're, they're, they're falling out of fashion and nobody remembers what they are. I've written a number of times about the, uh, the hotline, the red phone on like Commissioner Gordon's desk and what that was about. You know, nobody who's under 50 knows what the red phone is about. And similarly, the red stapler in, um, in that movie, you know, did you get the memo? Like there's a whole generation of people who know the meaning of the red stapler and everybody else is like, what are you talking about? It's just a red stapler. Anyway, um, uh, people were faxing in and the anti-government extremism is takes over and it takes over really dramatically on April 19th, 1995, a date that was chosen to echo um, Waco, uh, uh, you know, uh, Waco, not Ruby Ridge, Waco. Um, uh, when uh, a guy named uh, Timothy McVeigh explodes a bomb in downtown Oklahoma City in front of the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building, killing 168 people, including 19 children that are younger than six and injuring more than 800. And Timothy McVeigh had grown up on Red Dawn, uh, that movie I talked about. He'd been a gunner in the Gulf War, and he was increasingly disaffected as he got home, big, big consumer of a movement conservative media. And he insisted that America was turning socialist. He wrote into a newspaper saying, taxes are a joke. Regardless of what a political, political candidate promises, they will increase. More taxes are always the answer to government mismanagement. They mess up, we suffer. Taxes are reaching cataclysmic levels with no slowdown in sight. Is a civil war imminent? Do we have to shed blood to reform the current system? I hope it doesn't come to that but it might. And, you know, you can see how this, this, um, uh, disaffected, uh, um, uh, troubled man, um, has, had internalized this idea that somebody had to fight back against this communist government. And interestingly enough, against this, this overreaching government, uh, one of my favorite, um, factoids, I guess, if you will, in American history, is that when the police captured McVeigh, he was wearing a t-shirt that had a picture of Abraham Lincoln on it and the words, Six Semper Tyrannus, the words that John Wilkes Booth used when he assassinated Abraham Lincoln after the Civil War, accusing Lincoln of having created this behemoth government that was going to stamp out states' rights. All right, so... Um, 
Okay, I'm seeing, I'm sorry, I'm seeing Kristen Bourbon about dialing, uh, saying about dialing a phone number. I got to tell you, I think one of the funniest scenes in all of um, movies, all of this, a lot of them, I shouldn't say that, is Chris Rock in one of the Die Hard movies, whichever one it is, imitating dialing a, a, an old phone. Like I cry every time I see that because it's so right. My kids are like, you go, zero goes all the way over. You know. <laughs> anyway, so if that's, uh, if that's what's going on with McVeigh, there's also other things going on. You've got this cultural thing going on at the, at the national level, but you also have what's going on with delay and I'm sorry, uh, Gingrich and his people uh, delay an army inside government. And this is really important. First of all, they launched what's called the K Street Project. And what the K Street Project is designed to do is it's designed to make lobbyists work with Republicans. Because remember, Republicans in the House have been out of, and the House is the, 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 um, the body, the only body that is allowed to, in, to instigate, uh, not instigate, to initiate um, bills that spend money. So lobbyists tend to work with House people, and they had been working since 1954 with the Democrats. And Gingrich goes to him and he's like, you know, start working with Republicans or, you know, you're not going to get anything. So um, the K Street is the headquarters of Washington lobbyists. And increasingly, uh, they begin to work with Republicans. And um, and that matters because one of the things that the, the Gingrich people do manage to accomplish is they dramatically cut the budgets for House uh, representatives. And so they, they lose their staffs. And that means that when they are trying to write bills, when they're trying to understand bills, they no longer have paid staff to do that. Increasingly, they do turn to lobbyists to work on those bills because a lobbyist will say, well, I understand this. And we'll go ahead and write a bill, often with the help of the American Legislative Exchange Council, ALEC, to, to go ahead and write that bill. And that's how that happens. Um, the, the, the representatives simply don't have the staff any longer to do the work to figure things out on their own. They are more likely especially the Republican staffers, to simply uh, accept what is written for them by the lobbyists. Meantime, meanwhile, um, of course, this is not uniformly popular around the country. And in October of 1996, uh, the movement conservatism gets its own new media channel. Uh, and this is with Roger Ailes as its founding CEO. The, and it's uh, Roger Ailes is the guy who packaged Nixon. Remember, I talked to you about that, who carefully picked audiences and all that to package Nixon to hit emotions rather than hitting argument. And the Fox News channel is interesting because it's the brainchild of an Australian, a man named Rupert Murdoch. And, uh, and Rupert Murdoch is born in Australia. But because uh, a foreign uh, citizen can't own that much of an American channel, he goes ahead and becomes a dual citizen. He becomes an American citizen. So he is Australian born. And I do. And he is also responsible for multimedia in England. And I find it fascinating the degree to which Americans handed over control of our political system to one man, um, one man from anywhere, but certainly from one man who was not originally an American. And I, I just find that absolutely fascinating. But think of, think of you know, Rupert Murdoch gave us the Fox News channel. And it, there's re it's really interesting. You can actually find this. And I got to hurry up here because I'm going on too long. But you can find online. It's a little hard to find. But he gives an interview um, to, uh, to a newspaper, I think, in Australia early in early days. And he says, it's like a Burger King. I'm just selling stuff here. And it's clear that he sees a market for this movement conservative language. But at the time, anyway, what he's really interested in is the payoff. And it's interesting to see the idea of ideas being compared to, I believe it really is a, a Burger King. Um, and like I say, you can find it, at least it didn't used to be um, hidden. Um, and it certainly would be on the way back machine. I've cited it in a couple of books. And he's not, you know, he's, he's quite upfront about what he's doing. And this is back in the 1990s. And it's not behind a paywall. It's, it's you just got to search for it. Anyway, the Fox News Channel is um, is the, the answer to the movement conservatives' frustration with what they call liberal media. And the liberal media is media that insists on fact-based argument. Uh, and again, you know, rather than simply pushing a narrative, uh, the, the liberal media actually insists on facts. And again, one of the things I try and do in the letters is always use sources. And mind you, yeah, I screw up. Everybody does. But always to use sources and say, these are the facts. Here are the documents. This is where things are coming from, because that's what media used to do. 
And that is still what the mainstream media, the liberal media does. It has sources, it has, um, it has proof of what it's saying. You have to have at least two sources and you should have three to say something for most media networks. Um, and um, and it's interesting to me, I get, I get letters not infrequently saying that when I write stuff, you know, I'm just a liberal shill and I'm not looking at the other side and I should be watching Fox News. And I always say, if you send me the sources, if you if you prove to me what you are saying, I will publish it. And do you know, I don't have a single person who has ever taken me up on that, which I, again, find fascinating. Uh, the idea that somehow my footnotes don't outweigh um, the idea that there is there is a narrative out there that must be true, even though I can't prove it. And which is, again, one of the reasons I study ideology is because what people believe is happening is often more important than what really is happening. Anyway, so because of this, um, what the Fox News Channel does is, and I keep saying this, it is not a news channel. That is the name of the channel, the Fox News Channel. The same way the name of a channel is American Broadcasting Corporation or whatever the C stands for. Um, that's the name of it. And the, the, the second paragraph in the terms of use for the Fox News channel, and you can Google this right now, say this, is an, this channel is for, for your entertainment. And when um, Fox News channel personalities like Sean Hannity, who is in court right now, uh, he has a case, I mean, not literally, but in this moment, he has got a case in front of judges right now. Um, when he gets sued for saying something is true when it isn't or implying something is true, he never actually says it, he implies it. What he says is, I'm an entertainer. This is performance art and nobody should believe that it's real. And um, again, you, I, I've cited, written about that a number of times recently. I have cited it and you could Google that right now. Sean Hannity, comma, Hollywood Reporter. And I forget which case it was. I think it was Karen McDougal, but I don't remember. Um, in which his lawyers are literally saying he is an entertainer. You should not take him seriously. Um, the um, now there's an exception to that. Fox the Fox News Channel does have real reporters. Chris Wallace is a real reporter. He has sources. He, um, he tries to get at the heart of what's happening. Brett Beyer is a real reporter. Shep Smith was a, real re uh, was a real reporter. And Shep Smith did a fascinating interview with either Time or Newsweek a number of uh, two years ago, maybe, in which he talks about the difference between what he does and what the Fox News personalities do. And he says, I don't even watch them. I don't have time for that. They're simply entertainment. So anyway, what, uh, what uh, Rupert Murdoch does and putting Roger Ailes in charge is they create the idea of this media channel that looks like a news channel. Their personalities sit behind what look to be news desks, but they also perform a certain kind of America. They tell a story that is the movement conservative story of fighting for the little guy against communism and this large state. They have generally in the early years, older men who are very domineering, men like um, um, O'Reilly, Bill O'Reilly, uh, bright, very smart man. But he dominates the scene, and as now we know, he was a, a sexual uh, harasser, and uh, I, perhaps I shouldn't say any more than that because I don't remember the case. Um, and they are surrounded by uh, young, subservient women. Uh, this, I believe it's Fox News Channel that pioneers the glass desk, so you can see the women's uh, legs underneath the desk. And they are, um, they're all blonde, and they are really performing the idea of women who are um, part of that cowboy mythology. They're, they're, they're doing what men tell them to do. You can do a lot with what's actually happening on the Fox News Channel. Anyway, um, they use very colorful graphics. They use bullet points for their information. They try and strip all the hard work out of news simply to go ahead and create a narrative that is uncluttered with nuisance. And to hurry the spread of that new channel. Uh, Murdoch offered $10 per subscriber to each ca uh, cable company that carried the Fox News Channel. And even still, Fox News Channel money does not come from advertisers. Every time that someone says, oh, boycott Sean Hannity, they don't care if you're boycotting Sean Hannity because their money comes from cable fees. You are supporting the Fox News Channel by the cable fees you pay. They make a much higher percentage of cable fees than almost any other show I think ESPN might be higher. 
but I actually don't study those channels, so I don't know. All right, so um, increasingly the Fox News Channel presents a world that resonates with rural Americans who, uh, you know, increasingly hate taxes and increasingly are afraid of these dangerous, these people they're being told are dangerous by people like Rush Limbaugh. And Fox News becomes a major political player really quickly. Um, by the 20,000 uh, election, the, the 2000 election, I'm sorry, 17.3% of Americans are watching the Fox News Channel and three to eight percent of them move from being Democrats to being Republicans after watching the Fox News Channel. Um, and one of the things that Republicans figure out, the movement conservatives figure out, is that, and this is really sort of chilling, is that what they need to do to get their way is continually to push what is acceptable behavior and acceptable language in America to the right. It's called the Overton window after a, a theory by a man named Thomas Overton who works at the Mackinac Center for Public Policy, um, who says that there's a window of things people will accept. So you gotta just keep pushing it further and further right so that things that were unthinkable before are now okay. And here's one of the, th the places where you can see that happening in America with um, the fact that when Donald Trump first went into office, if you remember when, when um, Ivanka got an office in the, in the White House, everybody, um, everybody went ballistic and said, you can't do that, it's against the law and you, nepotism. Blah, blah, blah. And, and she kept saying, no, no, there's no way, I'm, I'm not gonna have anything to do, I'm there for my dad. I'm not gonna have anything to do with the government. Well, look what she's doing now. And people are just like, oh yeah, whatever. And that's only three years. So that's how the Overton window works. Anyway, Clinton nonetheless wins in 2004 because no matter how you spin uh, him or anything else, the economy does incredibly well during Clinton. You just can't spin that away. Um, but a budgets under Reagan and Bush had run almost $300 billion in the red. And um, at the end of his term, Bush suddenly announced that the year's budget deficit would be $60 billion higher than it was projected. And so Clinton pushes through a budget in 1993 that raises, raises marginal tax rates on incomes over $250,000. That's if you make more than that, you pay this on the t that amount above that. People make the mistake and think if you're in a higher bracket, all of your income is taxed at that rate. It is not. It's above that rate. Um, he increased that rate that fell on about 1% of Americans to 39.6%, increased the corporate tax rate by 1%, and increased the gas tax by 4.3 cents. And um, uh, the, the, the economy actually boomed. The Republicans howled that this was going to destroy the economy, but in fact, the economy does brilliantly. GDP climbs, it reaches annually 3% by 1997. Unemployment drops from 7.3% to 4%. Um, inflation falls from 3% to 1.6%. And the, the deficits that have been plaguing America since Eisenhower begin to shrink. And by 1998, um, he is able, the booming economy enables Clinton to, um, to actually cut the capital gains rates tax and, uh, and to balance the budget. So this horrifies Republicans who are afraid now if this actually works, we're going to end up with that liberal consensus again. They're going to lose the traction that they had. And so what they do is they turn back to that scandal, to the Whitewater scandal. Um, Paula Jones produced nothing, as I say, for Ken Starr, the Whitewater scandal, but uh, Ken, Paula Jones's lawyers give him the name of a White House intern, and that's Monica Lewinsky. Uh, they'd gotten her name when her friend, Linda Tripp, secretly recorded her very tearful uh, confession of, and of her heartbreak over having a sexual affair with uh, Bill Clinton. And Linda Tripp secretly recorded those tapes and then took them to a man who'd been part of Nixon's, uh, uh, Richard Nixon's Dirty Tricks team in 1972. And she took them to um, Paula Jones's lawyers, who then actually took them to Ann Coulter, uh, which is astonishing. Um, Jones's lawyers then subpoenaed Monica Lewinsky. She signed an affidavit saying she had not had a sexual relationship with um, with uh, with uh, Bill Clinton. And then Paula Jones's lawyers took those tapes to Bill Clinton. Uh, when they deposed, I'm sorry, to, to, not to Clinton, I'm sorry, to Starr. And when Starr deposed Bill Clinton, um, they questioned him closely about his relationship with Lewinsky. And he said, under oath, quote, 
I have never had sexual relations with Monica Lewinsky, unquote. That was a lie. Um, Starr had the tapes. He had Clinton on, uh, under oath lying. And he goes and he says, we can get him on perjury and obstructing justice. And for the next year, Starr went ahead um, and called witnesses and he leaked damaging gossip um, in, in techniques that looked a great deal like McCarthy's, to be honest. And when he finally issued his report in September of 1998, just in time for the 1998 midterm election, it was an excruciatingly detailed account of everything that had happened between Clinton and Lewinsky. And it is, um, honestly, I read it because I was preparing a course on American scandals at one point, and I concluded I would never teach it to, to students. It really reads like pornography. It's vile. Um, and it's it was interesting because he thought that it would turn Americans against Clinton. What it did is it turned people against him and the people who seemed to be persecuting Clinton, especially since Newt Gingrich himself was actually having an extramarital affair. Anyway, um, uh, movement conservatives um, thought that they were going to be able to bring Clinton down and um, to, uh, to, to get him out of office and to destroy the Democratic brand once and for all. They really called it wrong in a sense because they had, um, uh, um, uh, Clinton remained incredibly popular through all this. And Clinton, I'm sorry, Gingrich promised that he was going to pick up all kinds of new house seats in 1998 after the release of the Star Report. And he pumped a ton of money into the House races to pound on the Lewinsky scandal. But the Democrats actually picked up seats in the House. Uh, the picking up seats for the incumbent president in the sixth year of a term is so rare it had not happened since 1822. And Gingrich, at, after that, um, uh, resigned from Congress in embarrassment, both of what he had done there, but also because he was also having an extramarital affair with uh, Kalista, um, who is now um, the, uh, his wife and the, our uh, Trump's uh, minister to the Vatican. Anyway, but um, again, once again, the movement conservatives did not believe that um, th they believed the problem was not that they were overreaching with their ideology, but that they weren't doing enough. So they decided to go after Clinton and to impeach him. When Clinton, uh, when Gingrich was out of out power, pa um, uh, was out of Congress, power went to Tom DeLay, um, and he uh, was is an evangelical Christian, or was the time, I don't know what he is now, um, and he enforced his will on the rest of the Republicans by threatening to primary, that is to have a right-wing primary challenger for any Republican who did not get on board behind the idea of impeaching Clinton. So on December 19th, 1998, the House of Representatives voted to impeach Bill Clinton for perjury and obstruction of justice based on a statement under oath that he had not had sex with Lewinsky when they had, in fact, engaged in oral sex. Can I just say, when I went into this studying 19th century um, politics, I didn't ever think I was going to have to write as much as I've had to write in the last few years about what people do behind closed doors. This is not why I went into this. Anyway, I'll stop. That's editorializing. Um, well, the case went to the Senate for the trial and the senators were mortified. They didn't want to have anything to do with it. They held all of their, they, they called no live witnesses. They deliberated entirely in private and they, um, they acquitted the president on all counts um, because, uh, you know, first of all, because it, it was not playing at all well. Second of all, many of them were in the same boat. And third of all, his popularity at that point was over 70%. Um, and this, this is an interesting thing because the Republicans simply can't understand why Americans don't see why Clinton, in their view, is so bad. He's expanding this government. He's bringing, in their minds, communism to America. He's letting minorities vote. He seems to be backing de democracy, the idea of letting, in their minds, lazy people of color vote. He's, um, he's lying under oath. Why are they letting this man why are voters behind this man? And one of the things that really comes to the fore here is after this disastrous election in Miami, Florida, when there's two candidates, neither of which is a Democrat, by the way, um, fighting over the mayoral election, it's an incredibly corrupt election. Lots of people on both sides up in prison end up in prison with the impetus for that um, um, uh, vote that, that there actually was voter fraud there. or it, it, it wasn't on the voters' part. It was on the part of the leaders, and a bunch of them go to jail. 
Florida passes a law, a, a voter ID law that is designed to prevent voter fraud. You see this teeth coming back um, just in time for the 20, I'm sorry, for the 2000 election. And with that 2000 election, um, before the 2000 election, Florida throws, um, I believe it's more than 100,000 voters off the rolls and a later congressional invest investigation or government investigation, I don't think it's actually from within the congressional office, but from a different executive branch office, that investigation discovers that the vast majority of the people who were thrown off the voter rolls are in fact Democratic African American voters. So what happens is that by, um, by the end of uh, of Clinton's term, there is this ferocious right wing media empire that is trying to get the Clintons and everything they stand for out of office, aided now not only by talk radio and by the Fox News Channel, but also by new websites on that new Internet. Things like the Drudge Report, led by Matt Drudge and his assistant, Andrew Breitbart, who is going to go ahead and start Breitbart and bring on board somebody named Steve Bannon, who is going to take over Breitbart after Andrew Breitbart himself uh, dies a very untimely death of a heart attack, as I recall. Um, he's, he's quite a young man. Um, increasingly, those websites begin to aggregate anti-democratic gossip, anti-democratic news, and they begin to sensationalize rumor, to advance a narrative, and increasingly to build on an on, build an online community of like-minded right-wing radicals. At the same time that Florida is going ahead and pushing through a voter ID law that begins to purge Democrats from voting. You know this is where exactly where this is going over at least one more week, probably more than that, if you don't mind how much I am slowing things down. Anyway, that was the Clinton years. I will pick this back up next week with uh, the 2000 election and who's involved in the 2000 election and how the 2000 election plays out. As I have mentioned before, Roger Stone of today's fame is a big player in that election. Um, um, I'll tell you more about that next week. Anyway, uh, thanks for being here. On Thursdays, I do at one o'clock, I do um, uh, some history story. On Tuesdays at four o'clock, I try and answer history behind the news. Again, when I do these, I do not speak for my employer. Thanks for being along, and I will see you next week.